Before we start, I just want to say thanks for the kind words of support to continue this series. I've got a lot of questions from people asking where the source for this stuff is from and how accurate it is. While most of these developer stories come from interviews with Nagoshi and his team from Famitsu or fan-run websites, there's actually a series of books in Japan that discuss the entire creation process of Yakuza. We're aiming to combine all of these mediums into one cohesive narrative so you get a look at not just behind the series, but the creators as well. If you'd like us to keep going and get access to these episodes a little early, then please consider supporting us on Patreon. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss anything. One billion yen, or about nine million US dollars, was no small chunk of change in 2003. This money would need to cover everything from the design and development to the mocap and marketing. Thanks to the high cost of development, no game at Sega with a budget that high would be approved if it couldn't appeal to the rest of the world. They thought setting the game in the red light district of Tokyo and following the story of a Yakuza would likely not sell nearly enough globally to justify development costs. After many notes back and forth, Nagoshi considered amending his original concept to please the higher ups. He would need to take out the uniquely Japanese elements from the Yakuza games. The tattoos, the Yakuza themselves, even the Tokyo location. Kamurocho itself would be stripped away, leaving a lifeless city, occupied by boring, regular NPCs. No neon lights, no massage parlors, no hostess clubs, all in an effort to appeal to the imagined needs of a global market. Nagoshi refused to do it. He proposed a different idea to his bosses. Let's not make this with the foreign market's perspective in mind. If they appeal to all markets, the projected sales for a game like this was almost 300,000 copies. But why not double down on Japan and the emerging adult market? Make the game more Japanese, add places people will recognize and fill it with products unique to Japan. Go all in on their home country and aim to sell 500,000 copies domestically. That was the level of confidence Nagashi had in his game. Unfortunately, everyone else at Sega didn't share his optimism. This was an untested market with a game containing adult themes, Yakuza, and other taboo concepts. Nagoshi and Kikuchi didn't give up. They visited each department and explained their idea in earnest. Gradually, some people started to come around. Maybe it was the sense of pride Nagoshi-san's team had in their work, or that making something specifically for their fellow countrymen was an exciting idea. Unable to convince everyone, Nagoshi remembered the words of his old mentor, Yu Suzuki. When you do something new, people won't understand it. To think that they will is naive. Suzuki-san had been with Sega for years. Starting as a programmer in 1983, he worked on champion boxing before moving on to designing the classic arcade game Hang-On. Another game that was a completely novel idea. Would cost millions to develop and maybe even ruin the company. Like Nagashi, Suzuki-san had total faith in his product. Thanks to his boldness, Suzuki-san's arcade machines and video games helped build Sega as one of Japan's top video game companies. He continued betting the success of the entire company on every title he worked on, never bending on his creative vision. This is how games like Virtual Fighter and Shenmue came into existence. With these ideals in mind, Nagoshi-san announced to Sega, if this game doesn't become a hit, I'll take responsibility and resign. That was all it took for the remaining staff to get on board. Moved by his passion and commitment, they okayed his concepts. Plans were drawn up and work on codename Project J began. Nagoshi got to work writing the plot of Ryu Gagodoku and knew exactly what kind of story he wanted to tell. It was to be a complex interpersonal drama between different characters, each with their own motivations and ideals. He was urged to craft a simple good winning over evil narrative. Something like that would be easily marketable, but was decidedly not the way to go. As long as he was subverting expectations with his game, why not tell a deep, memorable story full of emotion and twists? Nagashi, like most writers, drew from his own childhood. He grew up in Shimonoseki Yamaguchi, poor and unhappy, having no real relationship with his parents. His father, who had incurred huge amounts of debt, was especially trying on Nagoshi's early life. Thanks to his family's debts, the other kids were encouraged not to go around him. With his mother being distant, he relied mostly on the company of his grandmother as the only adult in his life he could talk to. As a young adult, Nagashi left home and found himself in Tokyo where he worked part-time to take the entrance exams to Tokyo's Okei University, which he failed twice before getting accepted. His time was spent working to support himself and studying film production, while never receiving any financial support from his family. After graduating, he attempted to get work in the movie industry, but thanks to a huge slump, he couldn't find a job. 
After the partner he was dating at the time gave him a NES for his birthday, Nagashi got hooked on Mario Bros, sparking an interest in the video game industry. He applied for a few jobs and finally found work at Sega. The hours were long and the learning curve to develop video games was steep, especially coming from an artistic background in film. Nagashi never quit. You could say he became obsessed. Each day he worked tirelessly. Eventually, in August 1993, Nagashi finished work on Daytona USA, which went on to become a massive worldwide hit. He used the money he made to repay all of his parents' debts. This sparked Nagashi to reflect on his own childhood and why his parents had been so removed. Perhaps their debt was the cause of too much stress, or maybe they just didn't know how to raise a child so they kept their distance. Nagashi had made up his mind to reconnect with his family one last time. He booked a trip to see them, but unfortunately tragedy had struck in his absence. To his horror, his family home had burned to the ground, claiming the life of his grandmother. His mother, due to the shock of the fire and losing her mother, disconnected from reality and slowly started to lose her mind. She no longer recognized her husband or son. His wife's illness was a sort of wake-up call for Nagashi's father, and he straightened out. During their visits, he actually talked to and bonded with his son for the first time ever. As his wife's condition worsened, Nagashi's father did more for her in those last few months than he ever did when they were younger. During this time, he realized the only reason he could live an irresponsible lifestyle was because his wife would take care of everything at home. Now she would never be able to again. Sadly, it was too late when his father had realized just how important she was to him. Even though he never grew up in a loving household, Nagashi realized that he never lost those bonds between family. He finally had his story. A man that once fled from watching over those dear to him would return to face his own destiny. He named his protagonist after someone dear to him, Kazuma Kiryu, although it's never revealed who provided this inspiration. Going forward, each subsequent main character in the game is named after a special undisclosed person. Nagashi returned to work on Project J, now filled with determination to make his audience feel for his characters. Little did he know, he was about to meet the third member of Team Riga Goroku, the man that would become the scenario writer and eventually the lead writer for the series, Masayoshi Yokoyama.